Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Anthony P. Whoa. Right, how do I actually start the... Oh, I do it that way. Right, good. Interestingly enough, um, Joel Baxt, who uh, you just saw there, the rabbi, well, I was actually in contact with comparatively recently. And Joel Baxt is a fascinating guy, and I'm hoping to try and help him get his, his book uh, published in the UK, which could be quite intriguing, because he takes a very interesting angle on a lot of subjects, particularly the Kabbalah and DMT. So his, his work is very worth checking out. Right, I'm going to run through this as quickly as I can because it's quite a large presentation and I try to get as much information about me and my background on here as possible as well. Right, progress of a big toe. I'm not talking about that kind of big toe. I'm talking about something I call the Bohmian IMAX grand theory of everything. It will come clear as we go through exactly what I mean by that. It built up over a period of years. My first book, uh, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When You Die, uh, was published in 2006. And this was basically my attempt to understand near-death experience. Near-death experience from a neurological and a scientific point of view, but also from an experiential point of view. So in, in other words, understanding the fact that people do have this experience, it is reported time and time again, and it's consistent. It is also consistent across cultures. So clearly there is a phenomenon taking place, and it is unscientific for modern science to just ignore it. Science should pursue every single angle in order for us to understand the reality we live within. I also, this book was my attempt to explain a phenomenon known as deja vu, or actually technically deja vu, already lived. And what you will find in this book is I present uh, a philosophy and a science of what might happen to human consciousness at the point of death. This I call cheating the ferryman. The Bohmian IMAX is the three-dimensional reality creation computer program, for want of a better term, that we enter at the point of death. Um, if anybody wants further details on that, what I'd suggest you do is you actually check out this book, uh, Is the Life After Death, which is popularly known as ITLAD uh, within the circles of people that are interested in my work. My second book, A Daemon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self, took into account one or two interesting factors that came out of the ITLAD book, and particularly the idea that we all seem to have a hidden partner that exists in our lives, a hidden partner that travels through our lives with us. I guarantee that most people in the audience have sometimes had that sensation or feeling that something is very right or very wrong. I'm sure there are other people in the audience who've actually had experiences that you have had a sensation or a precognitive feeling that you're in danger. I hear people who have had been involved in car crashes and suddenly a voice will tell them to swerve, this kind of thing. This again is the being I call the daemon, which I think inhabits the non-dominant hemisphere of the brain. The daemon itself is the part of you that remembers the fact that you've lived this life before, which is a central part of the cheating the ferryman hypothesis which is in effect, if you have a deja vu sensation and you go to a place and you recognize it, or you have an experience where you recognize it, this is because you have lived it before. Straightforward, no other reason for it. There's lots of esoteric explanations, there's lots of neurological explanations, but the actual main argument is, is I say it's exactly as it feels, you've lived it before. Now the argument is there could be a part of you, which I call the daemon, that remembers the fact that you've lived this life before because in fact it's watching the movie of its own life. So therefore it knows when the dangers are about to occur, and that's how it can warn you. Again, this book does the science of this. Uh, many of my books are actually placed in the New Age sections of uh, bookshops, but I'm now starting to notice it's actually being placed now more in popular science. And this is because when people are reading the books, they're finding out that what I write about is actually based in scientific knowledge. I take certain information and I run around with it, but effectively it's still based on science. Everything I say in my books is actually referenced back to original source material. So effectively, if you read something in any of my books, you can go to the back and you can find the article and you can actually check it out for yourself. Because my argument has always been extraordinary claims need extraordinary proofs. And in my books, I give you the background material. All my books are, is my position on this, asking my audience and my readers come back to me with their own opinions and their own thoughts as well. And today we have episode three, and I'm going to be talking about my book, The Out-of-Body Experience, The History and Science of Astral Travel. 
And in this, I present a model I call the intramatic model. Right, I've discussed in detail about the near-death experience and the idea that at the point of death, people say they experience many things. They experience the idea of floating outside of their body. They experience the idea of moving towards a white light. They also encounter a being that they call the being of light. Now, I argue the being of light that is argued within a lot of the, 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 the research on near-death experience is, in fact, the daemon. Um, but what is intriguing, what is important for this particular part of the book is exactly what happens when people feel they float outside their bodies. There have been many, many intriguing cases over the years where individuals claim that during either trauma operations or heart attacks, they have not only moved outside of their body, but they have witnessed things from a point above the operating theater or looking over the shoulder of the, the surgeon. For instance, one very famous case is the Pam Reynolds case, where a lady was actually, they'd actually effectively stopped her brain functioning uh, and she still had an experience. The question is, what are these experiences? Are they real experiences? Are they hallucinations? But in point of fact, we will return to the fact of exactly what hallucination is anyway. Remote viewing. Time and time again, you hear stories of individuals who claim they can get outside of their bodies, and they can go and travel in three-dimensional space, see things, and report back the things they see. As you probably know, Project Stargate was a very large exercise the American government did to try and find ways and means of, of peeping in on what the Russians were doing, because they were worried sick that the Russians were doing exactly the same things. So the question is, when you read the cases of remote viewing, are they really seeing something in this external reality? Or are they seeing something different that they, ex they interpret as being part of this reality? Lucid dreaming, fascinating phenomenon. The idea that when you are dreaming in a dream state, you can become conscious and consciously aware of the fact that you're dreaming. And if you do that, you then experience your dream being self-aware of the fact of who you are and what you are doing that you are dreaming. Now, most of us, when we dream, we seem to almost experience things not quite right in the sense that you are aware and you're sensing the environment around you, but you are not aware necessarily that you're dreaming. You might be even aware of the fact that you're yourself. But some people can, using certain techniques, become self-aware in a dream state and can interact with other people and can wander around within the environment. I know of people that go back to the same dream environment regularly. Now again, this question I ask myself and I ask in the book is exactly where is this dream environment? What is it? Where is it coming from? You may be aware of the fact of the movie Inception, which very much takes the ideas of lucid dreaming and actually makes it into a very, very effective film. One of my associates, Robert Wagoner, uh, who's a member of my forum and uh, a Facebook friend of mine, has written a fascinating book called Lucid Dreaming. And interestingly enough, he calls it Gateway to the Inner Self. And again, he puts forward various techniques you can use in order to train yourself to lucid dream. I have to admit, I've never managed to do it. So effectively, I must be a profoundly stupid lucid dreamer because I can never, ever realize that I'm dreaming. I try so hard, but I've never managed to do it. So it would be interesting if there's any members of the audience who have actually ever managed to do this. And it would be interesting to talk to you if you have. So in terms of the phenomenon we're talking about here, here are some interesting individuals who have written books on the subject. Now, in terms of remote viewing, Ingo Swan was probably one of the most famous remote viewers. And Ingo Swan, if you read a lot of his work, it's quite fascinating because he goes to places and he sees things but they're never quite right. They're never exactly accurate. There's always something slightly wrong about them. And if you read his work, that fascinated me. The guy in the middle is Robert Munro. And again, there might be members of your audience that know about Bob Munro. Robert Munro was a businessman who, in his late 40s, started to have extraordinary dream sequences where he felt he was floating outside of his body. And one, one day, he, one, one, one night, he, was, he thought he'd fallen out of bed. And he started to push the floor. And as he did so, he floated away from the floor and floated back towards it. And he realized that it wasn't the floor, it was the ceiling. And he managed to move himself round and saw himself and his wife lying in bed. 
But what was even more peculiar about Robert Munro was that this happened to him a few times, and then he noticed a hole in the roof as he was feeling it. And he went through and ended up in an alternate reality. And in this alternate reality, he found a version of himself that was existing, which he called I there. And he was able to get into the mind of this other version of himself, which is very, very intriguing, because again, we have the idea, is he dreaming? Is he in a real state? Or what is genuinely happening here? He did attempt at one stage, he was a good friend of Charles Tart, an American uh, parapsychologist. And Charles Tart had moved to um, uh, California, and Robert had never been to Charles Tart's house. So he projected one evening in dream state, and he projected himself to the, the location of the house in California. Intriguingly enough, he got it about 40% right. But he got the color of the carpet wrong. He got the color of the curtains, the people in the room, what the people were wearing. It was again as if it's this reality, but not quite. A reality that's very close to this one, but is not this one. The guy on the, the other side is not terribly well known in the uh, English-speaking world. It's a guy called Waldo Vieira, who is um, a Brazilian. And this book, Projectology, is a scientific way of training somebody to get outside of their body. Uh, the the uh, International Academy of Consciousness, which is Vieira's organization, actually have a university campus down in Portugal where they train people to get out of their body. They have something called a projectarium. And again, these individuals, I, I interface with these guys you know, occasionally, and you know, it's very much the idea that they believe that the reality they're in is sort of a facsimile of this one. So this facsimile idea intrigues me. So what is really happening? Are these experiences that they're having simply hallucinations? Now, for a second, the word hallucination we bandy this around. An hallucination is, is considered to be an illusion. But we've got no way of knowing whether the reality you're now experiencing is an hallucination. The only reason you believe this is not an hallucination is because you share it with everybody else. In other words, it's consensual. You're in a consensual space with everybody else. Okay, So that's what you believe this reality to be. And when you go to bed at night, the reality is the same when you wake up the next morning. There are cases where individuals have had hallucinations they have shared with other people. Suddenly, the question of whether reality is consistent because we share it now, suddenly the question is, if people are sharing hallucinations, that means that's just as real, by the same application of logic. So we have to start thinking along different lines here. We have an interesting anomaly that doesn't fit in within the modern scientific paradigm. I think the secret lies deep within the brain. As you're probably aware, your brain is, cons consists of literally billions and billions of neurons. All the neurons in your brain, as you're probably aware, do not touch. They have something called a synaptic gap, which is between the neurons. And messages across the brain are actually sent, sent through, I hope I'll get this right with the red light, yeah, are sent through uh, by something called neurotransmitters. And what the neurotransmitters do is they modulate the message and they release a chemical, a neurotransmitter, which goes from one edge of one neuron to the next neuron. And this is how messages go across the brain. And it depends upon which neuron is released, which will depend upon your mood. This is how painkillers work. They just suppress the pain traveling across the brain. But neurons are quite interesting because neurons themselves, the structures within the neurons are very, very tiny things called microtubules. And there are literally billions of microtubules in every single neuron of your brain. So we're now talking about trillions and trillions of potentials, OK? Because each of the microtubules consist of two lines of tubulin. These lines of tubulin give off light single photon light called bioluminescence. What you may or may not be aware of is if you take light moving in one direction and light coming in the other, they cause what is called an interference pattern. The light, either, depending on the light waves, is how, whether they interfere with each other and whether they actually stop each other's uh, wave or they make it bigger. Okay? This kind of um, structure 
is also known as a hologram. This is how holograms are function. This is how holograms work. So inside your brain are trillions and trillions of these microtubules, all of which have the poten potential to create holographic images with light that is being drawn up from somewhere. Because the mystery is, where do biophotons come from? They don't come from the outside world. They're being drawn up from somewhere else. And of course, all a biophoton is, and all a photon is, is a particle or a wave. We won't go there. I go there with other lectures I do in terms of particle physics. But a biophoton, a photon is just a particle of electromagnetic energy. But it's more intriguing again because one of the things I've recently found is that within the microtubules themselves, there's something called the micro, microtrabecular network. This is inside every single microtubule. And it's a mesh of, of, of wires. Now, what does that look like? Fiber optics. Your brain is full of things that are potential to be fiber optics. And what do fiber optics do? They actually send light down and send signals down. So suddenly your brain is suddenly this huge processor of light or electromagnetic energy. So what is happening here then? Well, I suggest that here we have the brain here. Then you go, you drill into the brain to the neurons. The neurons, we got down here into the, uh, the structures within the neurons, into the microtubules into the light waves within the microtubules, into the microtrabecular micro uh, trellis. What is this drawing up, and where is it drawing this information up from? Now, I've been long intrigued by internal light. For instance, something called phosphenes. If you press the corner of your eye now, close your eye and you press the corner of your eye, you will see light. Okay? I have classic migraine. I see lights, I see images, everything else. Again, the question is, where is that light coming from? Because it's not coming from outside. When my, um, if you trace the optic nerve back into the head, it crosses into the brain, and directly above it is the pineal gland. Okay? So this is something intriguing here, because there's something happening peculiar in the brain. I believe the light that we perceive in dreams, the light we perceive when we have, uh, with, when the light is actually drawn up from the, um, the biological states, is light coming up from something called the zero point field, the quantum vacuum, as it's known. This, again, is probably a little known area of science, but if you start checking up on it, you'll find it quite intriguing, because an associate of mine, Professor Bernard Haish, who is an American astrophysicist, has actually got funding from the American government to find ways and means of drawing up energy from the zero point field. In fact, they've started a project uh, in Boulder, Colorado, where they're actually trying to find ways and means of drawing this energy up. And I believe this is why there's the fascination for the Higgs boson as well over in CERN, because the Higgs boson is a manifestation of the zero point field. What the zero-point field is, is a mysterious form of energy that's found at just above absolute zero. I think it's 272.15 Kelvin. That's very, very cold, and there should be no energy there, because the very definition of absolute zero is that there is no energy. The electrons stop moving. But there's something called the Casimir effect, and various other effects that have been seen, that even at that level, there is still energy coming up from somewhere. That energy is electromagnetic energy, and it's coming from the space between, between the particles, between the particles within the atom. Most of the world is 99.99%, 999, go on and on, empty space. You're empty space, I'm empty space. The only thing is we're just fluctuations in an energy field. This is what is happening here with the zero point field. Within the zero-point field, there's a form of energy that can be drawn up called Bose-Einstein condensates. And what these are, in effect, are a series of subatomic particles that act as subatomic, subatomic particles do, which is basically weird. And again, I haven't got time here to explain why subatomic particles are so weird, but they are. They're a particle, they're a wave, they can be in two places at the same time, they can communicate instantaneously across time and space. But what a Bose-Einstein condensate is, is a group of particles can come together 
and move in the same way, like you see with this picture here. And what it means is, is effectively, is that subatomic effects can actually affect the macro world that we live within. And again, Bose-Einstein condensates, they've been working with them now, and they find them incredibly peculiar. And they think they have massive potentials. So we have Bose-Einstein condensates, but there's something else that is very fascinating, is that Stephen Hawking has postulated that most of empty space in the subatomic particle world is made up of trillions and trillions of mini black holes. Now, this is Stephen Hawking. This is not some guy down the pub. This is Stephen Hawking. Now, funnily enough, I recently discovered in my last book, not this one, but the one that came out afterwards, Stephen Hawking has also come forward suggesting uh, a new alternative for some of the mysteries of quantum physics. And he's, he's worked with a guy called Thomas Hertog at CERN. And he's come forward with the idea, now get this, that every decision, every outcome of every decision that is possible is out there. You make a decision and you collapse what's called the wave function of that decision to make that reality come into existence. Again, Stephen Hawking. You know, so this is serious stuff. It's just that it's not out there in the general knowledge because they think that we probably won't be able to deal with this. You know, it's the idea, as one quantum physicist said, you know, it's like trying to give a child an atomic bomb because we're not supposed to understand all this. Because if we understand that the reality that we believe is solid reality isn't, what does that say about how we're going to react going forward? So we got all these mini black holes. We also have something called Einstein-Rosen bridges. And mini black holes are effectively Einstein-Rosen bridges. Because for every black hole, which as you know is something that is so dense that light itself cannot escape. So in other words, the light wave leaves and gets pulled back in to the black hole. But as well, the other side of a black hole is known as a white hole. And you get something called an Einstein-Rosen bridge where space-time is, is twisted by, the, by the, the sheer power of the black hole. And it opens up a wormhole in space. Okay? It's very much, I think, did Star Trek do something about this? But suffice to say, these things are happening inside your head with inside the micro, micro becular, becular, um, structures within the brain. And there's trillions of them in your brain. Is this where the light comes from in dreams? This is what William Bullman said, uh, one of the most famous astral travelers. Slowly I came to understand that the environment I was observing was not the physical world as I had assumed. I realized that the structure I normally observe when out of the body were non-physical structures. Now I finally understand why there were slight variations between the non-physical and physical furniture and other objects. For example, the non-physical walls were often a different color, and the shapes and styles of some of the furniture and rugs were different. Much of this was minor, but nevertheless noticeable. It appears that we are not observing the physical world from a different perspective, as many believe, but are interacting with separate but parallel dimensions of energy. This is one of the world's experts on this, and I'm actually in contact with William about this. I won't do that quotation because it's too long to go. So, where am I leading with this? Well, I believe that we can communicate with alternate levels of reality. And I believe we do it every night when we dream. I also believe that we do it in those liminal states just before you're asleep, technically known as hypno, hypno, hypnagogia. And just as you wake up, hypnopompia. You know, you'll see images, you'll see faces in profile, you'll see them moving around. Many, many people have this. And one of my associates, Dr. Andreas Mavromatis, has written a book on this called Hypnagogia. And he does, again, a lot of the stuff I'm trying to do with this as well. This device, I believe, is going to change the world. It's called the Lucid Light Device. We know it as Lucia. And what it is, it's invented by two professional scientists, Dr. Engelbert Winkler, who is a, um, a psychologist, and Dr. Dirk Prokel, who is a, um, a consultant neurologist. And what they've done is they've pulled their, their, their knowledge and their experience to try and to have a machine that will, will generate automatically something known as the flicker response. It's the idea when you see flickering light, you can actually go into alternate states of consciousness. This generates this. You sit in front of it, and you wait, and it's, it's attached to a computer program. Um, now, I tried this machine. Um, they invited me over to Switzerland because um, Engelbert has read a couple of my books and was very keen for me to try this machine out. 
Now, this is a photograph of me testing the machine out. I sat in front of it uh, for about two or three minutes, and nothing happened. And I thought, is this going to be one of these things that happen in my life that... Because I very rarely have any kind of strange things happen to me, just synchronicities and things. But I sat in front of it, and after about two or three minutes, suddenly there was an explosion of blue light across my right visual field. Then an explosion of red light from this visual field. And the two visual fields then started to move together. Tunnel effect. Tunnel effect, classic near-death experience. So whatever it was doing, it was starting to generate the classic near-death experience sensation. I had a sense of lifting out of my body. I felt that my hands were detaching themselves um, um, as if I was just rising out of the chair, which was quite disturbing. Then my eyes started vibrating in my head, which were really disturbing. But apparently I was told that was a neurological effect and a physiological effect because my eyes were getting encoding the light flickers. What then happened stunned me because I could see something shimmering down here in my, in my visual field. Now, again, as I say, I'm, I'm a classical migrainer. So I know about scotomas, and I know about, if any of those classical migrainers in the room, you know that you get these kind of castellations and fizziness. And it was like that. And I said, can I look at it? And they said, yes, because your brain will have encoded the light waves. The, 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 it will have encoded it all. So I looked down. What I saw, I still find it impossible to even begin to understand. I felt a sensation. These pictures are really describing how I felt. There was a kind of a fuzzy and a kind of a real weird ex explosion in my chest. And then I saw this. I felt I was, the chair was hovering two or three miles, ten miles, who knows, over, the, over a planet. As far as the eye could see were these lines. But, these, but I, this, was in black, this was in black and white, but what I saw was in color. And there were shimmering blue lights going down all of these channels. And I could see the curvature of the planet. I've subsequently found out, after reading some of the work of Carlos Castaneda, that what I was, the blue lights are something called the lines of the world that are registered, are told time and time again by shamans. I didn't know any of this. I didn't even know what this was until I actually got back to the UK and I was told by a friend of mine, um, Robert Bruce, not your Robert Bruce, but another Robert Bruce, an Australian one, who's one of the world's leading trainers in out-of-body experiences. And Robert said, and this is taken from Robert's book, and he said, you saw the astral plane. And I'm thinking, my God, this is a term I've heard over the, over the years. I've seen it. This is ridiculous. But nevertheless, I know what I saw. This is then the sensation I had, because I, I have to say, I lost my nerve. I said, switch the machine off. I'm too nervous about this. I then am talking to the other group. And as I'm talking, there is a kind of vibration starting in the center of my head here. And it was like a very small creature moving underneath. And every time I was speaking to people, it started going duh, duh, like that, and duh, duh, duh. And I didn't comment on it, but the rest of that evening, it kept reoccurring. I went to bed that night, and I had the most amazing dreams I've ever had. They were vivid, they were colorful. But what was strange was what was in the dreams. Snakes. I saw snakes everywhere. Normally twin snakes twining around each other. I thought, what the hell does this mean? I then went home. Funnily enough, this picture here, we were actually talking about this over lunch. <laughs> this is an Alex, Alex Gray picture. Apparently, I'm told, it's called death. But again, this was the kind of sensation I was feeling that night when I was dreaming. What was happening to me, and what I believe was happening is, the light had stimulated my pineal gland to release endogenously, that is internally, a substance known as dimethyltryptamine, DMT. As you're probably aware, or some of you may be aware, DMT is the most powerful hallucinogenic drug known to man. It's actually found in plants, it's found in the bloodstream, they found it in the brain. This is something generated naturally, it's inside us. Now this substance, and if you get the opportunity, a guy called Dr. Rick Strassman has written a book about this. I'm just checking to make sure I'm not running out of time here. Um, I now waste time trying to check whether I'm running out of time. No, never mind. 
Rick, uh, Rick Strassman has written a book on this, an American doctor who did a lot of research on this. And what he found, when people took DMT, they had consensual dreams. They shared dreams, they shared sensations, and they were consistent. And everybody that takes DMT says that the place you go is more real than this place. A doctor friend of mine took it experimentally a few years ago, and he said when he took DMT, he said he felt like his chest had crashed open, he was flying at great speed, and he, he was dumped in this place. And in this place, there were just clouds, and there were figures in the clouds, and something deep inside him said, oh my God, I'm back there again. And he was back in his body again. Now, I also deal with pe uh, people who have abductee experiences, with UFO abdu abduction experiences. These are identical to what people experience in dimethyltryptamine trips. There clearly is a link here. It's what the link is that intrigues me. Now, the pineal gland, I find, is probably one of the most mysterious objects in the brain. It's the only object, with the exception of some very, very small things, that is not duplicated. Everything else in your brain is duplicated. You have two amygdala, you have two hippocampi, but you only have one pineal gland, which sits in the middle of the brain. Modern science doesn't really know what it's supposed to do, but over recent years, they've discovered that what it does do is it excretes something called melatonin. And melatonin is the drug that makes you go to sleep, okay? But right through history, the pineal gland has been a, cent a great part of people's worlds. I won't go through all these, but effectively, the, the people say that it's a sim the symbol of the pi is a pine cone, because the pineal code comes from, from pine. And they say that the largest um, symbol of the pine cone is in the Vatican. I don't believe that is. I believe that's the biggest one. It's Angkor Wat in Cambodia, where I visited two years ago to do, do a TV, uh, to, to help some people on the TV program over there. Look at them, hiding in plain sight. Now, on top of that, you will find pine cone symbolism everywhere. In my next book, I have a whole section. New York is full of pine cone symbolism. A lot of the skyscrapers in New York have got pine cones on them. And they were designed by the same guy. And the same guy was a top mason. Pinecone symbolism works with masons. I'm now in contact with one or two masons who've said, yeah, you're actually getting close. They're actually very cryptic. But nevertheless, we're getting close here with something. Now, the, the two, my, my associates in Austria took the Lucia light device over to Larsa in Tibet. And they, they had guys who were part of something called the dream yoga tradition. And they had them sit in front of the light like I did. Now, these guys are some part of something called the Bond tradition. Now, the Bond tradition is the, the, the original shamanic tradition of that part of the world. And although they're technically Buddhist, because Buddhism is a very syncretic religion, the belief system was brought on board with the Bond. And the Bond believed that you, after training, you can get out of your body and you can travel in other locations. These guys, within three minutes of being under the lucid light device, we're seeing mandalas, we're seeing the things that it took years of training to do. Again, clearly, whatever is happening here is significant. But what was weirder was, Dirk and um, Engelbert, after the, they, they'd done the work on the guys, the next day, they were wandering around the Patala Palace, and they came across an isolated room, and they were allowed in it. And they went inside, and there were huge glass cases in this room, covered in dust. Inside the glass cases were these huge objects. They were ossified elephants' pineal glands that had been there, and nobody even remembered why they were there. And this brings us back to the point of the pineal gland itself and something we touched upon earlier on about the, uh, uh, the fluoridation. I've been doing work on this, and it does definitely affect the pineal gland. There is no question about this. What it does is it builds up it becomes more bony. But on top of that, the pineal gland contains very tiny crystals called brain sand. These crystals are piezoelectric. It means they're sensitive to electromagnetic radiation. What we were talking about light before, it's the pineal gland that's processing this light. The pineal gland, as you probably know, is also known as the third eye. Now, what I don't understand is how ancient cultures called it the third eye when it was only about 100 years ago they discovered, in fact, that within the third eye, there are actually, it's visual, it can, it can actually process light. In fact, there's a blizzard called the Tutora 
in New Zealand that it is a third eye. It actually has a retina. Ours has just gone inside our brain. The other intriguing thing about the pineal gland is that as the baby, as you're, and you're an embryo, at the 49th week of gestation, the pineal gland is at the back of the throat. It then starts to move up from the back of the throat to the center of the brain. The 49th day of gestation, according to the Buddhists, is when the soul appears in the body. So there's a clear link here. But what is even weirder, and if any of you do deep meditation or know people that do, you'll know this. There's something when you go into deep meditative states called the divine nectar. It's an acidic taste that people get at the back of the throat when they start to go into altered states of consciousness. I believe that's dimethyltryptamine dripping down the duct that's been left when the pineal gland moved up. It's not my original idea on this, I have to say. There's a guy called Beach Barrett in America that, that showed me these ideas. So clearly, the pineal gland is doing something very, very powerful. The book, The Outer Body Experience, that I've just described, that I, I discuss a lot of these outer body experiences, this is what Professor Irvin Laszlo said about it. And he said, Peak brings us closer to understanding the, the mystery of the real world and the many ways we can apprehend it. This is what this book is all about. It's about a great deal more, as much more than any book I have read. Reading it is a mind-expanding experience that must not be missed. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but Irvin Laszlo, is, he's been nominated for the Nobel Prize twice. And for, him, for have Irvin Laszlo to be saying something about my work like that is incredible. But I genuinely believe the things I'm developing now have profound significance. And I'm not being vain, I'm not being difficult. I'm just stating a fact. It does seem that this does resonate with so many people. From here, where am I going to go next? Well, the book that came out recently is my take on time because I'm now actually working with the idea of what is time, how does time function within the brain, what can we explain about time in terms of the scientific ideas of what time is. Uh, this book will be reviewed in 14 times uh, next month. I'm hoping for another nine, because my last two books got nines out of ten, so I'm hoping for that on that one. I also um, have edited a book on make it, uh, called Making Sense of Near-Death Experience. This is a technical book for medical people for when somebody has a near-death experience so that they know what to look for. And I've, I've worked on this one with um, two Australian consultant psychologists, psychiatrists, I should say. And in fact, much to my amazement, considering I sometimes think I'm a persona non grata in certain areas, this was nominated for the Psych Psychiatry Book of the Year at the British Medical Association three weeks ago. In fact, we were highly commended, which is amazing. So, it, so what's happening is now the authorities are starting to see what I'm writing and starting to react to it and say, well, actually what we're talking about here does have some form of validity. Now, again, this book has other, pe other people who have made contributions as well. So, and the last, the one I'm working on now that I have literally finished this week will be called The Gateway to Infinity, The Pineal Portal. And this will be all the work I've been doing in recent months like, for instance, working with Joel Baxton, people like that. And this book will really, really pull everything together in terms of what I'm trying to do. And that, I think, is it. Now, I'm sorry about rushing through that. Uh, I don't know how much time I've got left on here. But what I wanted to do was to give as much time possible for any questions that people have as well. Because what I've done is I've, I've given you an awful lot of information. And there's a lot there. I haven't done any of the quantum physics. I've done very little of the neurology. But as an introduction to my work, at least this is giving you an opportunity to understand where I'm coming from. My philosophy is a simple one. Modern science has got itself down a cul-de-sac. Science is like it was 110 years ago. There are certain things within science they cannot explain. They cannot explain how inanimate matter brings about consciousness. It's called the hard problem. David Chalmers, an Australian philosopher, has brought this up. Because when you think about it, your brain is ultimately made of inanimate matter. How does inanimate matter bring about you with your, your memories, your future, your fears, your hopes, your loves, your dreams? You shouldn't be existing in a world of matter because the mind is not matter. It is the opposite of matter. It doesn't occupy space, does it? It, doesn't o it occupies time, but it doesn't, it doesn't have extension in space. But your brain creates it. They don't know how, they have no idea of that. Quantum physics, they still have profound problems with something called the, um, the twin slit experiment and the idea of, of matter as a particle or a wave. These things are mysteries, and these are the things I'm trying to find out. And what I say to people is, I, I'm, I'm actively on Facebook, I have an active reader group, 
I want people involved. I haven't got the answers. If you see things in my books that you think are wrong, I've got them wrong, I misunderstand them, that's fine. I'm not a guru, I'm not anything special, I'm just an ordinary guy trying to find answers. You know, I'm not going to teach you how to do astral travel. I'm not going to teach you how to have any of these things, because I don't know. But what I do want to know is your experiences, and together we can probably take science and everything else to the next paradigm. And I think that's the most important thing. Cheating the ferryman does not belong to me anymore. It's not Anthony Peake, it's everybody's. And we're working on it together, and there are thousands of people around the world involved in this. But all this is on my website. So come in, join it. It's great fun. The water's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. I think what is happening is that the, 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 the hypothesis is so wide. Um, in fact, I, I, was, um, I was invited to talk at the Edinburgh University Philosophy Society uh, at the end of this month, in fact, here. Uh, and literally the middle of this week, um, they pulled the rug from under me because um, they decided because I, I didn't have the academic back, I, I, didn't, I didn't have university tenure, and therefore I couldn't speak. And it is clearly because whatever I'm saying is certainly starting to worry people purely and simply because I do the science. You know, I do know what I'm talking about. You know, if anybody wants to debate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle with me, I'll do it all night. So effectively, you know, it is, it is, this is, this is the way of the future. Spirituality and science have to work together. And it has to. We're not enemies. We're all trying to find the same thing, which is understanding why we are here and what it is to be inside your head. You know, isn't it the most wonderful thing? You know, science is, is amazing. But the most amazing thing is that I'm inside my head perceiving these things. Now, there are people like Daniel Dennett and various other materialist reductionist psychologists who will actually deny the existence of inner life altogether. You know, we're deluding ourselves. We, we, we're not conscious at all. We just think we're conscious. Who on earth Daniel Dennett thinks he's, t he's, pay he's, he's taking the royalty checks for his books, Consciousness Explained? I've no idea. But effectively, every single person, the one thing you know with absolute certitude is that you're inside your head and thinking. That's the only thing you know. Everything else is presented to you by your brain through brain processes, isn't it? Everything else is. I am. I'm probably just a projection of your mind trying to help you explain why you are here. That's a thought, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I haven't, but I think that is quite intriguing, isn't it? It's the idea of somebody might be in a dream state, then you, you play some music to them, and then that music becomes part of their dreamscape, and then they can create a dream around that sound of music. Exactly. Yeah. Because <laughs> that, that's intriguing. And funnily enough, what is also intriguing is people tell me that when they are lucid dreaming, there are other entities that actually are consistently within their lucid dreams that they interface with. There's one guy who tells me that he's lucid dreaming, he comes lucid, and there's a whole crowd of people, and there'll be one guy looking at him, and he'll come over to him, and then the next night, he'll be somewhere else, and there'll be a lot more people, and that same guy will be there, as if this person actually has physical existence over and above the, the, the observer of the dream which is very intriguing. Does this say that there are entities out there? In which case, you have to be very careful. And I don't know, I have to say. Thank you. The major question about hallucinogens is exactly what they're doing in the brain and what they're bringing about. For instance, with dimethyltryptamine, they banned dimethyltryptamine, I think, in the uh, mid-70s, I think, something like that. LSD, they did something similar. And I think it's because what it's doing is it's giving people the idea that there are alternate realities that they can travel to and that this is, the only, this is not the only reality. But, of course, there is the danger that there are downsides because, effectively, if your brain is not ready for it or your consciousness is not ready for it, 
It can bring about paranoia. It can bring about a lot of things because suddenly you're in a world that you're set adrift in. And funnily enough, one of the people, if anybody listens to Red Ice Radio in Sweden, uh, if you go onto redice.com, there's a series of interviews I've done on Red Ice. And one of the interviews I do is with a guy called uh, Tom Campbell, who's an American uh, researcher who worked with Tom Campbell. And Tom is a, is a physicist, and he has this model of alternate realities, which I say that with things like dimethyltryptamine, you can actually break through into alternate realities. Now, I believe the alternate realities that you break through are the realities that we, that maybe ghosts exist in disincarnate spirits, whatever we want to call them. I think that this can explain an awful lot about the nature of reality. And those anomalous things that we all experience. You know, whenever I give talks like this, 80% of the audience will have either had precognitive dreams, precognitive deja vu sensations, out of the body experiences. These are phenomenally common. They have to be explained. And I think with hallucinogenic drugs, there are sometimes dangers. But I think the difference with, with dimethyltryptamine is it seems that it is generated by the brain. They've actually found receptor sites in the brain called TARS, T-A-R-R-T-A-A-R-S. And TARS seem to be designed specifically to work with dimethyltryptamine, which effectively means they are natural. And if they are natural, what do they signify? And I suggest that what they signify is when you go into a dimethyltryptamine trip, for want of a better term, you are encountering entities and these entities, I think, are linked in some way to DNA. That's why there's the snake symbolism. That's why you see the caduceus with the twin snakes. You have the, the, uh, the opening up of the um, Kundalini experience. The Kundalini experience goes up the spine on two sides, the pingala and the whatever it is going up the, the, up the side of the spine. Again, it's the symbolism of DNA. And I believe that it's DNA that is communicating with us through these drugs. One final point on this, for instance. The shamans in Latin America were asked how it was they discovered a drug called ayahuasca. Now, ayahuasca is quite intriguing. It contains DMT. But if you take DMT and you swallow it, you can eat as much DMT as you like. It will not affect you. The only reason it can be effective it, when it goes into your stomach, what happens is something called the MAO inhibitor in your stomach, which is an enzyme, stops the DMT working. The shamans in Latin America, however, when they make ayahuasca, have two plants, one of which contains the DMT, and it's Banisterius capi, and there's, uh, and there's Psych Psy Psychoptria viradas, I think it is. And they mix these two plants together. One of them contains an MAO inhibitor, and the other one contains the DMT which means you have the hallucinations. There are 50,000, at least, types of plants in Latin America. The shamans found the two plants, put them together in exactly the right way to make the drug work. When they were asked how they did it, the shamans turned around and they said, the plants told us. The snakes told them. Because, of course, shamans can go into these states normally. DNA is communicating with us, and it's trying to communicate with us through DMT, which is my opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, Hi. Anthony Peake. Thank you. Right. Thank you.